All right, we're going to begin with the two homework assignments, chapter nine, homework five and six. Then we'll do the FRQ and then we'll do the rest of the uh, chapter seven through nine review. Mm. Probably need something to write with. During a game, a soccer ball having a mass of 0.4 kilograms is kicked from rest to 26 meters a second and collision with the player's foot lasting eight milliseconds. What is the impulse? I always laugh when I have to get up and get the writing tablet because it makes me think of that um, Folgers commercial where the person's in a Zoom meeting, but he's got the camera too low and you can see that he's only wearing his boxer shorts underneath his uh, shirt and tie and, and you know, uh, jacket. And not that I'm only wearing my boxer shorts, but just the fact that probably every single time I stand up, you guys go, he's wearing the same shorts he wore last time, right? I mean, it's like, I'm the only one in here, you know? Why can't I just wear the same shorts all the time? Um, why do I need to take a shower more than once a week? Right? I mean, I do. I'm pretty much in showering every day, but you know, it's like you don't need to. We're on, we're on uh, distance learning right now. Nobody noticed. That's nice of you. Or maybe you just say it, and then you guys talk about me behind my back. I don't. Hey, good. The chat's staying open. Um, I don't do anything special to the chat. So I'm not sure if you're able to communicate with each other privately, if you want to. I know when I try to do that during our staff meetings, we can't do it. So that means that somebody in administration is, is um, not allowing, oh, you can't. So I have to, you can only do it with me. Yeah. So um, maybe there's something where you have to enable that feature. Cause I don't think that that's a problem. I think that if you guys, uh, you know, like, let's say that you were looking at question number 27 and I started solving this one and you're like, there's something not right about what he's doing, but you're kind of a, a bashful or, or something to, to, or intimidated to say something that you should be allowed to ask somebody else and that it would be okay. But first of all, you shouldn't be bashful. If you see me making a mistake, stop it immediately. Nobody has called me out on the lab. I've been giving you guys eights and nines out of 10 on the lab. And I've gotten two of the answers wrong. One of them, I got it wrong because I misread it because I read it the way I wanted to read it. And the other one I got wrong because my brain was thinking backward. So, and nobody's called me out on it. And I know partly it's because the stuff's not easy. So therefore then you, you don't know that you're, that you're actually doing something correctly and that the teacher's the one that's incorrect. But, um, so we need to show that. But anyway, in solving of these problems, same thing um that you would tell me that you uh if there's something that you don't think is right good morning john good morning riley sorry i didn't say good morning um all right so in this one they are just asking for the impulse you can see here that i wrote f times t and i keep moving the pen over to the other side of the equal sign because i so badly want to put delta p there but i'm not supposed to put delta p there because they simply just want to know what is the impulse acting on it? Oh, I have to do that because the problem is we don't know what the force is. We've been told that the time is 0 0.008 seconds, but um, in the end, as I go to this side, so the soccer ball is kicked by the person, MV final minus MV initial. I know that this part right here is zero. So right now I've got F times 0 0.008 equals the mass of the soccer ball times the final speed of the soccer ball. Now, my first uh, instinct is to solve for the force. And if I do that, I get the question wrong on the AP test, which is why I never get perfect scores on the multiple choice, because I always read into the problems what I wanna do and not what they want me to do. They wanna just know what is all of this together, including the 0.08. So all we do is just multiply these two numbers and get an answer of, 11 newton seconds on your test there is one question that asks you to solve for the impulse acting on something you have to include the units i made all of these problems worth either three points or five points depending on what the problem is doing this one here where it talks about impulses worth three points you will get two points for the correct answer and you will get one point for the unit 
I don't grade significant digits. So if you have 11.01 .01 or something like that, I don't care. If you round it to 10, I don't care. Um, but what I do grade is that you have the units there. So make sure you include the units. I will probably tell you that in the Zoom when we get started on the test on Tuesday. Question number 28, a 0.061 kilogram handball goes from rest to 20. Da, 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 da. How long did the impact, in, impact last? In other words, what is the time? It means at this time I am solving inside of the impulse portion of this equation. MV final minus MV initial, put in all the values and solve for T. And I think that's pretty straightforward, uh, 0.012. Yes, whenever it says impulse, it will always want the F times T. And that's weird because we are so used to having a variable for anything that we're asked. But impulse isn't just a variable. Impulse is an F times a T. It's a force times a time. Um, momentum is an M times a V, but they do call momentum P, right? So how come an impulse is a F times a T? Why don't they call it an I? You know what? If you guys want to call impulse I, you won't hurt my feelings. I wouldn't take any points off on this if you said I equals and then solved it. You're, that's fine. Definitely on the AP test, if you called it imp, then you would definitely not be hurting anybody's feelings because then they just know you're abbreviating the actual name of it. So um, just something to consider. Question number 29, a glider on an air track is 30 centimeters long and has a mass of 0.5 kilograms. It floats frictionlessly on compressed air. A 100 gram wind up toy car is placed on it and immediately rolls due east at 0.5 meters per second. So if the glider, there's my little, not glider, there's my toy car, starts rolling to the east at 0.5 meters per second, that's gonna cause the glider on the air track to move the opposite direction. So we're really comparing a 0.1 kilogram mass to a 0.5 kilogram mass is gonna be a five to one ratio, right? So if the toy car goes 0.5 meters per second, I expect the glider to go 0.1 meters per second. And that's what we should see as an answer there. All right, let's keep moving on. Sorry, I was just seeing who was here because I wanted to write somebody a private message. Oops, I don't know if, I'm, if it's possible. Do I not want them to send a private message to Glenn? That wasn't the one I was thinking. Nothing personal, Glenn. I think I spelled it right. Congratulations. Yeah, I spelled it right. Eight kilogram puck floating on an air table is traveling east at 15 centimeters per second, coming the opposite direction at 25 centimeters per second is a two kilogram puck on which is affixed a wad of bubble gum so that the two slam into each other and stick to each other, find their velocity after the impact and how much kinetic energy was lost. All right, I don't want to draw the picture for this one. I'm going to just go to the end. No, I didn't even draw a picture for this one. Um, but notice what I did here is we have a eight kilogram puck, I'm assuming like a hockey puck is, or maybe like the air hockey puck, right? You know how that real thin light, I mean, eight kilograms is really heavy, so that doesn't make any sense, but it's moving this direction and then moving in the other direction is a smaller puck and it's traveling at 25 centimeters per second. Somebody asked me when they submitted this homework assignment, do we have to change the centimeters per second to meters per second? And my answer was yes and no, or no, really, I should say it the other way around, no and yes. In other words, when you're doing the conservation of momentum section of this, you don't have to change the centimeters per second. You can leave it in meters per second. I'm sorry. You don't have to change the centimeters per second. You can leave it in centimeters per second. I didn't. I changed it to meters per second. But when you get to, oh, and I didn't even do the energy part of this. When you do the kinetic energy part of this, you have to change it to meters per second because joules is based on meters, not based on centimeters. 
So here we have to do it. Um, we would say one half of eight times 0.25 squared plus one half of two times, I already screwed that up, it's 0.1 in that first one. Try that again, 0 0.15, 0 0.15, and then, yeah. Point two five. Notice that I did not include the signs. Energy is not a vector quantity. It doesn't care about the direction. So I don't need to include the signs. Up here, I did need to inc include the sign. That was the other question I got from the same person. Does it matter which direction we choose to be the negative? No, it doesn't. If you choose for the, I chose east, apparently. No, I chose if traveling east, I have these even backward, don't I? Eight kilo, no, I don't. I do have it the right direction. It's just that I put the numbers in the wrong place. These are backward, right? So I don't even know if my answer is right. So you know what? I'm going to start all over and do this problem right here on this page because if you guys are looking at my answer slide, you're like, uh, this is confusing to me. I'm confused. Okay, so we have an eight kilogram puck traveling east at 15 centimeters per, per second. We have a two kilogram puck traveling at 25 centimeters per second, the opposite direction, and then they're gonna to stick to each other. So afterward, this equals two pucks stuck to each other by that gum like that. And so we can say eight plus two and say V final. And now I can really just turn this into an equation right there with what we see. Okay, so, uh, but the problem is now I got to try to do the math. I guess I can use my calculator since it's sitting right here. Eight times 0.15 equals 1.2. Did I have the numbers at least right on this slide? I didn't even write them down. So I'm going to guess I didn't. Two times 0.25 is negative 0.5. And then on this side, 10 times V final. We got to do this right because this is like the lion's share of your chapter test is being able to do conservation of momentum. Uh, 1, 1.2 minus 0. 0.5, I think it's just 0. 0.7, positive 0. 0.7 equals 10 times V final, which means that V final equals 0. 0.07, positive 0. 0.07, and that wouldn't be centimeters, that would be meters, meters per second. Did, is that what I had as an answer? No, I did not. So that tells us that I did make a mistake with flip-flopping the two uh, velocities, okay? Um, what does the positive tell us? So back to the person who asked me, does it matter which direction we pick to be the negative? No, what we do is whatever direction we pick to be positive and, and, and which direction we pick to be negative, the answer then tells us which direction that we're still moving. So if this was the positive velocity and this is the negative velocity, what we know now because of my answer is the two of these are moving together ever so slightly this direction with a positive velocity. All right, that's the important part because on your test, if you don't say, if it asks a question, uh, what is the final velocity and direction after the impact, you don't just put the positive sign there, you won't get the credit for the direction you have to actually put, based on what's given in the problem, what is the direction, okay? All right, now the kinetic energy part of this, KEI is one half of eight times 0.15 squared plus one half of two times 0.25 squared. And then the KE final is one half of 10, because they both are added together, times 0.07 squared. There's your two kinetic energies. I'm not gonna solve that because I've already wasted so much time on this one problem, but I did it all wrong. So therefore we had to. Question number 31, eight kilogram puck floating on air table traveling east at, isn't that what we just did? No, brand new. Oh, cause it bounces backward this time. So big puck is traveling at 0.15, we're going to call that the positive direction. Small puck is traveling at 
0.25 negative because it's the opposite direction. After the collision, big puck, we don't know what it's doing. Small puck is bounced backward at 20 centimeters per second. So two times 0 0.20 and right here, eight times V final. I mean, I can't possibly be speaking over anybody's head, am I? I mean, this is really, really easy stuff. You just have to account for everything. Regular physics students, when I give this on to them, they don't get this now this semester because uh, we didn't get far enough into the, in, into the first semester. Um, but when I give this as a chapter test, it's amazing how many people get a three out of five on this question because they just blatantly disregard the signs. They just put in, they put everything incorrectly except for that sign right there. And on the answer key, I have the answer if you use positives the whole way through. So that's the main thing with this one is that you, is that you just make sure you account for the directions by using a sign. Let's see if I did this one correctly. I am thinking I'm pretty happy with how that all worked out. Two kids in a small boat at rest with respect to the water play catch with a one kilogram lead ball. The total mass of the kids plus the boat is 250. What is the speed of the boat when the ball leaves one kid with a speed of five meters per second? So here's our boat. We have a kid on one side and the kid's gonna throw a ball to the person on the other side, all right? So if we look at this as an internal system, if you give velocity to the ball in one direction, then to make up for that, you've got to give velocity to the boat in the opposite direction. So this is really kind of an explosion style conservation of momentum problem. We would say that M1, V1, I plus M2, V2, I are both equal to zero. Before you throw the ball, there's no momentum. Even if the boat's moving relative to each other, everybody's all got the same speed. Okay, then after the collision, M1, V1, F, or I don't know if we want to call it after the collision, after the explosion, in other words, once the ball leaves the person's hand, we can say a one kilogram ball is traveling with a speed of five. So therefore a 249 kilograms left over, in other words, the rest of the boat without the ball, because the ball's left his hand, what speed will it move at? How about a very slow 0.02 meters per second? That brings us to our second assignment, a skater with a mass of 75 kilograms traveling east. All right, now we got the directional one. So we have a skater, I'll make a block that is traveling east at five meters per second. And we have another skater. So this one is 75 kilograms. And then we have a 45 kilogram skater traveling south at 15 meters per second. They collide with each other. When they collide with each other, we know they're gonna go off at an angle like that. So in order for us to solve this, we have to do a conservation of momentum in two dimensions. So maybe I'll start with the X direction. In the X direction, I'm gonna say that the 75 kilogram skater times five meters per second plus the 45 kilogram skater times zero has no velocity in the X direction equals tangle them together 120 and solve for V final in the X direction. Meanwhile, in the Y direction, we've got 75 times zero. They have no initial velocity in the Y direction. 45 times 15. Do we have to call that negative because it's south? It's up to you. If you want to, that's fine, but we're taking care of the direction by looking at our picture. Uh, equals 120 times V final in the Y direction. Once you have those two velocities, then we can say that V final itself is equal to the square root of VX squared plus VY squared. And then we also can say that the angle that it goes off at is inverse tangent of, now we got to decide what to put on top and what to put on bottom. So for me, if I say that this is the X component of the velocity and this is the Y component of velocity, and I move that over to here to make a triangle, to me, I feel like this would be the angle that I would want to solve for. So therefore, I'm going to say the side opposite is the VY and the side adjacent is the VX.
And now I've got my two answers when I solve those two parts. I hope I have that on the next slide. I do not, but you guys can handle that. Question number 34 and 35. I mean, if we were gonna say that something should be on a chapter test or something should be on an AP test, this is it. You guys are looking at a question. In fact, you have something not, un, not unsimilar not, or dissimilar. You have something that's kind of like this on the test. You use conservation of energy and also conservation of momentum in the same FRQ problem. So this one is definitely worth our time. The only difference is I'm gonna give you numbers. And the reason why I'm gonna give you numbers is because otherwise I can't make so many forms of the test. This is really the kind of question when you can just do one form of the test, or at least if everybody's in class, the teacher can make sure that you're not uh, sharing, right? A soft clay block is suspended so that it, uh, so as to form a ballistic pendulum. Sounds like we're doing something with Mythbusters. A bullet is fired into the clay. So the bullet hits the clay. Probably if you saw this in the textbook that it came out of, you could probably see a little bullet hitting into this, or maybe you don't see it until it gets to this picture right here. I don't know. Anyway, it causes the pendulum to raise up to a height H. Write an expression for the muzzle speed in terms of GH and their masses. Ugh. Hey, Mr. Purser. Yeah. There's a question in the chat. Okay, where does the 60 degrees south or west come from? Oh, no. I didn't notice that. That right there makes this problem completely different than what I did, didn't it? Because this 45 kilogram person is not traveling south. They're traveling at an angle south of west. Oops. Okay, let me uh, reset this up. Sorry about that, Vic. I'm not gonna solve it. I'm just gonna explain it. So we'll get out of this quickly. Okay, so 60 degrees south of west means that what we would say is our 45 kilogram skater is going at this angle right here when they collide. This would be the angle of 60 degrees on the south side of the west, west axis. So what we have to do with this is we have to begin by finding the X and Y components of the, we'll call this VIX and we'll call this VIY, okay? What is that change in the solving of this problem? Is that the X component of the, uh, the X direction momentum is now some value that I'm gonna put in, which I'm gonna call it negative VIX. And then I can still solve it. So whatever that value is, once you do the component stuff, you put that in here. Down here, this is not 15. This is actually VIY. Okay. So what that changes is uh, solving for these two things, but they're still, once you solve them, they're going to still fit into these equations uh, based on what you get for the X and Y directions. And I'm still not going to solve that one through. You don't have a two-dimensional collision on your chapter test or your final, so it's not worth the time. But Vic, it's definitely worth your understanding because we both know about you and getting high scores on AP tests means that you can't miss little things like what I just did right there. So it is worth knowing, but it's not something that is a priority for you right now. Okay. Sorry about that. I didn't even, I don't even know how I didn't spot that. I mean, the 60 degrees was right in between me reading 45 and South. I told you, will I get a perfect score on the AP test? No, because I have the ability to just look gloss over words, right? I saw 45 kilograms south because I read this problem how I wanted to read it. I didn't read this problem the way the textbook wrote it, okay? So please be careful because your teacher's not. All right, back to this one. Very, very test worthy right here, except for that we would be given numbers. All right, so here's what we know about this. First of all, the pendulum rises to a height of H, all right? So we know that there's something about the fact that um, 
when the bullet hits this, the bullet is going to cause it to move. And I know that when things collide with each other, that what I have to do is I have to say that the collision uses conservation of momentum. So therefore, I'm going to say the mass of the bullet times the velocity of the bullet plus the mass of the, oh gosh, why does that be bullet and block? How about if we call the other one clay? Mass of the bullet times the velocity of bullet plus the mass of the clay times the velocity of the clay equals the two things add together times their final speed. Now their final speed is right away here at the beginning. V final is right as the bullet hits and impacts into the clay is what that V final is. Now I can simplify this down and call it mass of the bullet times velocity of the bullet, which there's your money question, is equal to mass of the bullet plus mass of the clay times V final. Now my problem is I can't put this in terms of G's and H's and all of that stuff if I don't know what V final is. So maybe I should take this one more step here though and say the velocity of the bullet, which is the, which is the money question here, that is the muzzle speed, the speed that the bullet left the gun at is the speed that the bullet hit the clay at is equal to MB plus MC times V final over MB. You cannot get full credit for that expression because it has V final in it, which is not one of the allowable variables. I'm assuming that the M's are also going to be allowable variables, even though I didn't write it into the question. But let's see, maybe they'll cancel out somehow when this is all said and done. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I've got to analyze the swing because what's going to happen is the clay is going to swing upward to a height H. And that to me sounds like conservation of energy. Had we been in normal class, we would have watched the bowling ball swing back and forth and talked about this, but we did talk about it back in that section that we can say that the kinetic energy initial when it gets hit by the bullet, it picks up speed causes the clay and bullet to rise up to a height at the final part of the swing. Pendulum swinging back and forth, follow the rules of conservation of energy. One half MV squared equals MGH. Okay, so now we have to consider, I don't know, I mean, we could cancel the M's out because the M is the mass of the bullet plus the clay. It is both part of both parts of these. So maybe I'll just cancel it out anyway, but I may return that back in if I need it for something for substitution. I don't think so, but I'll cancel it out for now. Now the one half of MV squared is the same MV, or I'm sorry, is the same V that is up here from the collision uh, expression. So this is the, you know what, let's color code it. Just to give it a nice color coding, this V, I'm going to call it green V. And then therefore down here in this equation, I can call it green V as well. So green V is the same thing in the conservation of energy as it is in the collision uh, expression. And that's equal to G times H. So now that tells me then that green V can have the substitution to G H. So I'll just go up to this expression here and say that the speed of the bullet is equal to M total over MB times 2GH. Oh, okay, there we go. And their masses. See, I'm not reading things completely. They did allow me to put it in terms of their masses as well. There's the expression. Does anybody feel happy about that as an answer? Because I don't. But we have to accept that because that's the way the AP test works. They like getting answers that are expressions rather than actual numerical values because they're going to do everything they can to keep you from using this. They don't want you to use it. They're going to say to you, sure, use your calculator on your test. Go for it. Where are you going to use it? If you're doing everything as an expression, um, it just doesn't do us any good. All right. The second part of this, number 35, says derive an expression for the percentage of kinetic energy converted into internal energy. So that's the term that they use for describing the loss of kinetic energy. So for me, I'm going to say then the KE initial is based on the bullet, one half 
mass of the bullet times the speed of the bullet squared. By the way, I have an expression for that. And then the KE final, this would be the KE once it embeds itself into the, uh, into the um, clay is equal to one half MB plus MC times VF. That's the green V. Okay, you ready for this? Because it's about to get ugly. All right, four. This one here, we have a velocity of the bullet expression. One half MB times MB plus MC over MB times 2G. Ah, I didn't root. Ah, we got a problem here. I didn't square root this, did I? This was supposed to have a square root around it. I knew something didn't feel right. So right here, this expression should have a square root in it. Caught it. Okay, good. So now this becomes square root of 2GH. And this whole quantity for root GH is squared. So now if I simplify this down, the MBs cancel each other out. The square and the square root cancel each other out. And we end up with the initial kinetic energy is equal to MB plus MC. Doesn't that seem crazy that the initial kinetic energy can be written as an expression that includes the mass of the clay that isn't even moving, but that's where the substitution says that it should be. And then times 2GH, and now the one half and the two can cancel out. And so we end up with MB plus MC times GH. There is your initial kinetic energy. Now let's see what our final kinetic energy is. Over here, we have one half of MB, I forgot to put the square here too, plus MC times, uh oh, I'm getting nervous. It's, Riley, it gets worse. I think it gets worse because what I'm gonna put in for VF is root 2GH squared, squares cancel out, Two and one half cancel out. And we get the same answer. I know that's not possible. I know that is absolutely not possible. So what that tells me is that for me to find the final kinetic energy using my expression substitutions, I can't do this. I have to somehow do it probably based on looking at what the potential energy is after the collision instead, because if these two things equal each other, that means that our collision was 100% energy conserved. They never, ever, ever are 100% energy conserved. In fact, in inelastic collisions, they tend to be less than 50% uh, conserved. I was hoping that we were gonna end up with a one half out in front of this so that I could go, wow, the kinetic energy cut it in half and it didn't. So when you put that, that's brutal, you put that, that's brutal and they're just at the perfect time when I went, oh shit, I'm getting the same answer that I got in the first part. I can't get that. And right away, anybody who wants a five on an AP test immediately has an oh shit moment, okay? So, but you know what? You just take it and you move on. And that's what I'm going to do because we don't want to spend the time to see if it's possible using potential energy for me to then get a value where it shows it's less than the initial kinetic energy of the bullet by itself. All right. So I'm going to let it. I see where my problem is. Nobody called me out on it. I see where my problem is. I should leave it as a 10 point extra credit. You should take a screenshot of this. There is a blatant math error as to why my answers came out to be the same. For 10 points, if you catch it, 
or I can drop it down to five points if you want me to direct you towards where the mistake lies. So how about if I just leave that up? Let's just leave that up for right now. I'm gonna go into the FRQ because I don't wanna waste everybody's time here. This is not important for, right, for priority right now. For priority right now, we gotta get into the review. But in terms of your growth as a thinker for an AP physics test, wanting to get a five on it, um, this is the kind of thing where if you have a mistake like this and you catch it, you're one of very few people in this country that would catch that mistake. I just got lucky that I spotted the mistake. But there is a blaring mistake here, and I'm going to leave it as 10 points of extra credit if you can tell me in, privately in the chat what the mistake is. And then if nobody tells me what the mistake is, then I'm going to lower it to five points of extra credit, and then I'm going to point out to you where the mistake is, and then you can see if you can still find it. Okay? I can see John's face right now just staring at it like, hmm, I want that 10 points. I could use that 10 points. All right, I told you uh, last time we met that I was gonna begin the review by doing the FRQ. And so a lot of you did the same thing. What you sent to me was homeworks five and six, and then you sent me the review. I just wanna let you know that what I put on my sheet is if you turned in the two homeworks, you got two points per homework assignment. If you turned in only the FRQ, you got one out of three on the review. And if you just turned in the review questions, you got two out of three on the review. If you turned in both, like Katie did and Matt did, then you got three out of three on both, okay? It might say on Aries that it's only worth two, but I'm gonna change that column to three to include this. So for those of you who didn't do one part of this assignment, do it tonight or do it before Monday and then, or Tuesday and submit it to me and then I'll still give you I'll, I'll add that in and you'll get full credit because I do want you to do the entire review because all of it's good practice. But this is the part that we want to start with while you guys are still fresh. And honestly, this is all the more I'm going to do. I'm not going to do the actual review today. The answers are online and they're all simple questions. So if you have a problem, you can just email me and then I'll answer your problem individually. I'm sorry, John, I didn't point out nice Christmas lights in your, uh, in your bedroom, I'm assuming, or maybe you're okay. All right, two identical 0.25 kilogram spheres are released from a device at time t equals zero from the height h equals two meters as shown. Sphere A has no velocity and falls straight down. Sphere B is given an initial velocity of v zero and travels a total distance of 3.5 meters before it reaches the ground. Air resistance is negligible. In a clear and coherent paragraph, explain which sphere hits the ground first or if both spheres hit the ground at the same time. So all of you should, at the very least, I'm gonna speak slowly because we want you to have a moment to go, what would I put if I, because you know, like I said, only one, two, three, four, five of you have actually looked at this FRQ ahead of time, maybe six, because one of you told me that you looked at it but weren't sure what to do. So we'll give you a moment to look at it again. What would you do in part A? Well, how would you answer it? You don't have to write anything down. Just think about how you would answer it. Well, Kyler, of course, I'm not going to ignore it. I'm happy that you took a shot at it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to, we're going to leave, obviously, that's already in the chat. When I go back to that slide and I uh, start saying a few things, I just want you to tell me whether or not what I'm saying is what you were trying to say or not when we get to it, because I believe you. You'll, I know you're a truth teller, so you'll tell me the truth if it is uh, what you meant. Was that enough time for part A? And all of you would say they hit the ground at the same time. Now, if I gave this to you on your final exam or your chapter test, that would only be worth one point out of probably three, maybe out of five but they hit the ground at the same time. You have to explain coherently why they hit the ground at the same time. And so you might be saying something about the, uh, uh, the fact that sphere A falls a distance, well, let's not even use an S, we can actually call it H, falls a distance H based on one half AT squared. And sphere B, even though it has an initial velocity V zero, 
falls a distance h based on one half a t squared. Okay, now just writing those things alone is not enough. I'm just doing that to speed this up. You have to say all the words in between. The velocity that sphere B has is a horizontal velocity and it does not affect what is going on in the vertical direction. The vertical direction is independent of the horizontal direction. So both of them fall a distance H in a time T based on the equation S equals VIT plus one half AT squared, okay? So make sure that you're coherent with that because if you're not coherent, you won't get the full points on it. Question part B says on the energy diag on the energy time graph, sketch and label a graph of the potential energy of each sphere. Okay, so um, I am speaking slowly. I'm giving you a moment to think about this too. So I'm going to think about my answer before I answer it. This must have been on last year's AP test because, or maybe two years ago, because I've never done this problem before that I know of. I, but you know, I have a terrible memory, way too much drugs and alcohol in college. And so therefore remembering things, I, I recognize that I took a hit and it's something I've just got to live with for the rest of my life. All right. What does your graph look like? So in terms of energy, we'll make potential energy the red color. Would we agree that both balls have the same amount of potential energy? So if I decide to put this as the um, potential energy based on a height H, I can say that for red, the potential energy is going to decrease uniformly so in other words, as a nice straight line until it reaches zero. Uh, now, maybe I should actually figure out how much time it, well, I can't figure out how much time it takes because the problem is, is that they didn't give us, yeah, they did. They told us that H equals two meters, Never mind. I can actually figure out the time it takes. So um, I'm gonna say two equals one half of 9.8 times T squared, which means that T equals, Two divided by 4.9. You know how many times, <laughs> I don't know if I should tell you guys this, but I've been writing tests. Riley, was that like a mint julep or something? Looks like you have a little cocktail there. Kind of early in the morning for a cocktail, isn't it? <laughs> Not if you're from the South, it's never too early for a cocktail. Um, oh, I've been making so many keys because I have to do the key before I can actually push out the test so that I can find the mistakes. And they're riddled with mistakes. I'll be in the middle of something and go, oh no, the final kinetic energy ended up being more than the initial kinetic energy and that can't happen. And so therefore I have to rewrite the test question. So I'm telling you this sarcastically, but this also includes regular physics too. So it's not just you, but here's what I was about to say. Do you know how many times I have divided the height by one half 9.8? or in other words, two by 4.9, and then square rooted it. Hint, 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 on your final exam and your chapter test that you guys should be prepared, that projectile motion is still here to haunt you. You will be doing projectile motion on both tests. Hint, 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 hint. Uh, that came out to be 0 0.408, and then I need to square root that. Uh, 0.64. Ah, you know, when I get an answer like 0.64 and I look down at a graph and see that 0.6 is more than halfway down the graph, I get a warm, fuzzy feeling because that means whoever made the graph made it so that we could uh, use as much of the graph as possible in making our diagram. So I'm going to draw a line that goes from wherever my initial potential energy is all the way down to 0.64, which is like right about there, okay? And I might even go so far just because I'm nervous, just to say that this is the PEI. I don't know. I just feel like I wanna put a label on this axis, but it does say sketch and label a graph. So I don't know, maybe I already did the labeling of this and on the actual AP test question, there wasn't all of that label but I just feel like I should put something there. 
Um, you know what? Maybe I should even go further. I'm, I'm really not being that smart this morning. Don't I know how much potential energy there is initially? Yeah, I know the mass of the sphere and I know the height of the sphere. That wasn't a good choice. Remember, this is my, this is my test booklet. I can make mistakes in it. PEI is equal to MGH, which equals, man, how come nobody's calling me out in the, uh, uh, the chat? that I'm making mistakes on these kinds of things. I know why you're not calling me out because not enough of you did the FRQ ahead of time. Those of you who did, maybe you just copied it straight from AP Central or did some kind of BS to me, I don't know. But I'm getting an answer of 4.9 joules. So I'm gonna change that number on here from a PEI. I'm gonna change that to a 4.9. No, 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 don't call it 4.9, call it five. So one, two, three, four, five. Now I'm in my test book, or now I'm in my answer document. And in my answer document, I'm gonna start right below the five and I'm gonna go right before the 6.5. And now I'm gonna get full credit. I'm heading towards a five on this AP test now. Question part C says on the energy diagram, sketch and label a graph of the kinetic energy of each sphere. Okay, so how about we'll do A, oops, let's do A in green, and we'll do B in blue. Now nah, that's too confusing, it's already blue in the equation. So B in black, perfect. Okay, so the kinetic energy of A, since A just fell straight down, Conservation of energy says if it started with 4.9 joules of potential energy, then we would say that for this is all talking about A right now. That we could say that uh, PE final equals zero. And then we can say that KE initial, since it wasn't moving, was equal to zero. And that KE final has to equal 4.9 joules. So therefore, what I can say then is for the green graph for A, its kinetic energy goes from zero up to four point, oh, I wanted to use a nice straight line for that, from zero up to 4.9 in 0.63 seconds. Yeah, I'm happy. That's part C, A. Now let's go to C, B. For object B, we're graphing its kinetic energy, remember, we know that, I think that I wanna do letter B as an actual uh, conservation of energy formula when I solve this out. We're almost done. For those of you who are sitting there going, oh God, when is this gonna end? It's gonna end really soon. PEI plus KEI equals PEF plus KEF. This is the only way I feel comfortable with this. I've made so many mistakes today. I found them all but I've made so many mistakes today, I wanna to get this one right in the first try. I know that initially ball B has 4.9 joules of kinetic energy, of potential energy also, because it starts at the same height H, two meters. How much kinetic energy it had initially is one half MVI squared, okay? So let's figure out what that is. Uh, it was given an initial speed, oh man, why'd they have to do that? They gave us an initial speed of V zero. So I'm gonna to have to say one half M V zero squared. Okay. What's its, so this would be 4.9 joules plus one half M V squared. Now I know that afterward it has zero potential energy because it hits the ground or it's about to hit the ground and that all of its energy has been converted into KE final. So I would then say that it's KE final is equal to one half MV zero squared plus 4.9. So therefore I have to start at 4.9. See, now I'm mad. Now I'm really upset with myself. But this is why you do everything in your test booklet first. And then you go and put stuff into your answer document after you finished it all, right? Because does everybody see the problem that I just created for myself? 
You're all looking at this going, hey, Mr. Purser, what are you going to do? Draw more lines on your graph because how do you go from a starting kinetic energy of MV0 and go up 4.9 from that? I don't even know where M one half MV0 is. So maybe I would have to make an assumption. I'm guessing that what probably is true about this test is that form that the actual test has different graphs for parts B and C because we need new labels. So I'm going to do that. We have time, right? Anybody in a hurry to go do something else? Did anybody else get a brand new mountain bike in the last couple of days and therefore needs to hurry out of class so they can go ride it? I don't think so. Anybody else drop $4,300 on a brand new mountain bike? That's the flex. Um, well, let you know what? One of the things that uh, you learn in life is uh, don't flex before it's time. In other words, oh no, I'm sorry, Vic, that sucks. Uh, my wife actually was very happy. My wife is happy when, when I'm happy, which is why she's a great lady. And I'm happy when she's happy, which is why I'm a great husband. Um, so she recognizes that I don't uh, just go out and waste money. She knows that uh, I will use $5,000 worth of that bicycle. So therefore I actually saved her $700, right? Um, and probably that's true too. Invite Sancho over while I'm not around, right? Um, uh, oh, I was gonna start by saying, you shouldn't flex before it's time. In other words, I don't actually have the bike yet. It's supposed to get to my house today. So now the fact that I said that to you, it's gonna show up and the frame will be bent. And I'll be like, oh man, I gotta send it back, right? So see, I shouldn't have done that. But in the middle of that, Vic said that his brother's bike got stolen, which sucks because I've seen uh, his bike and that bike is a great bike. And that's sad. And that's one of the things that you guys got to understand when you get to college is if you have a really nice bicycle, let's say that you get into mountain biking, road biking, something like that, you can't leave it out in the rack. You have to bring it into your dorm room or your house. If you, if you are a person who bike commutes to school and locks a bike up at school, you have to buy a crappy bike that you can do your commuting on because it will get stolen. If you put a chain around it, somebody will cut. That's you have to think about. All right, back to our energy diagram for part C. Because I don't know what V zero is, I hope you guys can still hear me. It says my internet connection is unstable. Because um, the, he's gone. My sister's bike was stolen at her college. So she just stole somebody else's. You know, uh, that's true too. In the country of Belgium, they don't lock their bikes up there. People just go outside and they just take whatever bikes on the rack and they ride it to wherever they're going. And because there's more bikes than there are people, then nobody thinks that way. So the only bike that you take care of is your racing bike. You keep that in your, in your house. But otherwise, the bikes on the street, apparently, from what I've been told, I don't know if it's in Amsterdam, well, that'd be the Netherlands, but I don't know what town we're talking about, maybe Brussels, that people just take whatever bike is there and ride it to wherever they need to go. So I don't know. Um, so, but I don't believe that because I have met both of the Andre girls and neither of them are thieves. So I don't even believe your story. All right, let's finish this. Stop talking to me. There's your answer. In 0.63 seconds, it's going to go from, and I shouldn't, uh, here's what I should have put. One half MV zero squared and then one half mv0 squared plus 4.9 because it was an energy diagram not a velocity diagram okay all right i butchered that but at least i didn't make a mistake i mean i had to add in some stuff at times but i don't think i made a mistake that was a harder question the first one was a little bit easier c got kind of hard but 
what they wanted us to recognize is we started off with some initial kinetic energy and ended up with more kinetic energy and you can see it in the black writing that's there. So hopefully that makes sense. All right, your test on Tuesday is not a long one. Um, I'm expecting, I'm expecting you to be done with this test. It's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It's got ten questions. Only one of them is really a prompt. Everything else is actually answerable. So therefore, I'm expecting you to be done with this test in about forty minutes. So probably at around thirty-five minutes, I'm going to start saying, "Okay, where are my first tests?" And then. When I start getting my first test, I'm gonna start calling the rest of you out because the problem with this one is if I give you 50 minutes to take the test, that gives you 10 minutes to copy down somebody else's test. And that's enough time because it's a very short one. So far, you guys have proven to me that you don't do that. So therefore, I'm not as concerned with this class, but it is a short test. It should not take that long. Um, it does have conservation of, of energy it has conservation of momentum in both elastic and inelastic collisions. It has projectile motion. It has impulse. And then it repeats and it does the same things over again in different problems. Okay, there is no question on here that asks you to do anything with work. There's no question on here that asks you to do anything with power. But those are on your final. So you might as well study those anyway, because your final is just a week later. Does anybody have any questions about the chapter test before I next talk about the extra credit problem that we need to fix? Which so far I've only had one person put anything in here. Well, you can get a job. Okay, good. I haven't missed anything other than uh, Kyler's the only one who responded to what I might have done wrong to get the first answer to have the same thing for both sides. All right, um, then I'm going to go back to that slide. Oh, that's that was it right there. Oh, let's no, let's go forward first. Uh, hey, there was an answer to that one question. I did have an answer slide. I don't know how it got pushed in the middle. These questions here are pretty straightforward. You should do them. They are due. They do count for two points. The FRQ, if you just copied it down on this slide, you should turn that in too. It's worth one point. Altogether, your review is worth three points. So make sure that you do it. On the day of your test, I am going to send out to you a video lesson of the final exam review. And then you can watch that at your time instead of waiting for the, the Zoom day for the test, which would be, I'm gonna turn off the share. We don't really need to uh, turn off the recording of this. We don't need to record anymore.